of an independent, advanced self, self-publishing salon. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, with me, Joanna Penn and Orna Ross. Hi, Orna. Hi, Joanna, and hello to all. Someday she'll say it all from beginning to end. Yeah, I, I, have, to, I have to go to the other tab to kind of read what, what the hell I'm meant to say. <laughs> One day we'll come up with a snappy, a snappy thing. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, exactly. The salon. Okay, so today our theme is how to launch a book doing it your way. Uh, as in, we won't be doing hypey, hypey, launchy, launchy stuff. We will be telling you what Honor and I do. Um, after all these years, uh, we've been... <laughs> so that will be coming up soon. But um, as usual, we like to give you a bit of an update because we are writers too. So Honor, why don't you give us an update uh, what's been happening with Ally and also with you? Yeah, um, well, exciting times as ever. We're writing conference season. By the time this podcast goes out on our podcast, because we're actually recording this a week uh, earlier than we normally do, we would have been to Indie Lab, which is the first Writers' Digest conference um, for in, exclusively devoted to indies, which is very exciting, and we are delighted to be part of it. Michael Laurent is going to be there representing Ally. And Writers Digest is now an Ally Partner member, and we'll both uh, next year, well, from now, but particularly in, in 2019, concentrating hugely on this whole um, idea of authors building sustainable author business. So it's fantastic to have the support of a partner like that for that. We are very exercised in our life at the moment about copyright because of this um, EU stuff that's going on, which we mentioned very briefly later. <laughs> but um, lots of myth and misinformation going around about copyright and what it means and all of that. And we're trying to desperately to keep up with all the legal stuff. Met with the Authors Collection and Lending Society Board. And we're going to be making a deposition to the UK or party committee on author earnings um, in November. So important times, I think, for working out how we're going to go into the future around these kinds of issues. And in our eyes, we're updating all our guidebooks for the year for 2019. There are so many changes in 2019. Every year this happens, right? Every year this happens. But I think this year was really, you know, a real year of shakedown, which is hilarious because back in January, we were saying, that's it, it's now settled. <laughs> well, no. Oh, yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, what are you up to? Oh, goodness. Uh, well, I got a Valley of Dry Bones to my story editor, and I, and she's kind of now my first reader, because this is book 10 in my Arcane series, but I still love working with an editor slash story first reader who knows my world and my series and challenges me. And I know I've heard a few things around the indie way that people are, uh, are not using editors so much once they become more developed I guess but I just love it I love having the challenge and let's face it I mean we're in this game partly to create but to learn to learn new things to become better writers and it, it, it but it's one of those moments you get it back and you thought you know I knew there were a few issues but she got them she nailed the issues so I've actually had a lot more rewrite not rewrites but you know some story wrangling to do so I've got another seven chapters to do tomorrow on Saturday <laughs> Only seven chapters. Only seven. I mean, it's, just <laughs> it's just line editing. It's just line edit. So, and it's like the third pass for me, which is quite a lot. So then that will go back to her. So, and then I've, I'm off to Nink on Monday, uh, Sunday for um, in Florida, Novelists Inc. If people don't know, so I'm speaking there, and of course getting ready for all that organising everything. So it's kind of been a little bit, um, a little bit mad. And we'll come to the launch stuff uh, in a minute. But that's that's kind of mean what I'm doing. And what have you been doing as Orna Ross? As me, as my, my writer me. Yeah, well, um, as everybody knows, I'm rewriting these books from the creativepreneur angle kind of thing. And as part of that, I um, started a new thing a little while ago where on Facebook, um, on, in a closed group, just bringing a, a group of people together for um, some of the practices that are outlined in the books and that's been amazing because I've only ever thought physically before and getting a huge amount of feedback from it and I love it at one level and I'm really uncomfortable with it at another level you know that way when you're yeah. doing something that's creative that stretches you you've got these two things going on but uh, but I know it's I know it's a good thing 
um, doing lots of work around the launch and off to Matera in Italy on Wednesday and from there then on to Digital Book World in Nashville, so prepping for those conferences. And as if all that was not enough, uh, lots of reading uh, because the, it's storyteller competition time again, Amazon's um, storyteller competition, and I'm a judge again this year, so I had five books to read in about five minutes, um, well, not five minutes, but lots of reading, as anybody who's ever judged a writing competition will know, you, you know, the reading is intense and very, very interesting, but I'll talk about that in a while when I can. But um, yeah, lots, lots and lots happening. I think you just made made up another word there, uh, oh, creative nice. terror. <laughs> yeah, well, people are using this now. Really? But, yeah, it's it's kind of for people who build passion based business. So they are so writers are included in this. Um, it, what it is is kind of highlighting the fact that. An indie author who's working from the kind of models that you and I are always talking about has far more in common with, say, life coaches who are trying to, for example, who are trying to create impact and influence through publishing, social media, and so on. And anyone who essentially, for the business, is equally important to the profit because traditional business advice is always, you know, put your passion to one side, focus on profit. And the creative kind of puts the passion out front and doesn't think about profit enough. And then the creative preneur is somebody who kind of brings those two aspects, you know, holds them 50-50, holds them together. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a little growing movement. <laughs> well, I, I'm definitely in it. I just haven't used that word. You have so a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I'm um, the internet for you. I'm definitely getting a lot of feedback, so I'm just going to ask you questions and not talk so much. Um, so uh, tell us what is going on with this EU copyright thing? Yeah, I'm not going to tell you all of it because we lose every reader in the, or every listener in the house, but um, essentially we, the European Parliament has been debating a copyright directive for ages now and um, it was passed and there is a lot of debate about this and whether it's good for us and whether it's not and I think what it has highlighted from you know an indie author's perspective I think what it has really highlighted is how we sit firmly in the middle between the traditional creative industries and lobbyist sort of um, position which is um, so, for example, we're represented by people like the Society of Authors um, here in the UK. And then the, on the other side, you have the individual creatives um, and the internet freedom people and, you know, people like, say, Cory Doctorow. And they're talking very much about this is bad for um, creatives because we're going to have to go through these sort of meaningless legal things like GDPR you know, which just throws a whole load of legal stuff in on top of us. Or like the um, queries we're constantly getting from Amazon, do you own the rights to this? Well, it's going to layer, you know, lots more of that in on top of us. Um, and that's, that's one big issue about it. There are others. Um, whereas on the other side, people in the creative industries here in the UK and throughout Europe, whom I really respect, are going all out to try and improve um, payment conditions for authors. So it's fair, and we're we're kind of caught in the middle, and mm. we weren't even asked to be there. You know, people <laughs> like us are not. I don't mean we necessarily as ally, but somebody like ally should be there because what happens with the EU and with big big legal uh, generally is that they are thinking about Google, Amazon, Facebook. Um, Book particularly obviously all the big you know siren servers as they've been called and they're completely ignoring this huge movement of creative printers and in the authors and such like who are building micro businesses yes but very mm. profitable little businesses that rely very much on things being free accessible and available but that also rely on the concept of copyright and intellectual property so uh, you know, the vote may have been passed, but this one isn't going to go away. It's going to go on and on. Yeah, and just thank you on behalf of me and everybody listening and every, all the authors, because I looked at some of the stuff on this and I was just like, oh my goodness, I'm just going to wait until you understand what's going on. 
<laughs> and, and because I know that you've been involved with this type of thing for so long and from different places, so you you understand a lot more. I think they design those documents to just be to make you fall asleep within about five seconds, and you just kind of just want to kill yourself whereas you know how how important it is but yet your eyelids just keep dropping so I'm really pleased that you're looking at this with some legal people well we have to look at it in the sense I think it's part of our responsibility you know part of what we do and and, um, it's important to look at it but you feel very powerless you know you don't feel that there is a, a lot you can do and yeah, um, anyway, we keep on keeping on. Uh, we are mm. trying to work through the contacts that we do have. And while we may not be there ourselves, we are talking to people and explaining. That's why it's important to meet people like the ACLS board who are clued in at all sorts of different levels who have been doing great work for authors on the micropayment front for 100 mm. years now. Um, so through organizations like that and through discussions with people like Society of Authors and so on, we can at least inform them and make sure that they understand at least some of the issues from the author perspective. Yeah, and that's to be ratified in January, I believe. So January 2019, so probably our February show, we we'll might talk about that again when this has actually gone through, because it's not gone through yet, so we shall see. Uh, something else um, Europe-based, but kind of amusing in many ways, uh, that the uh, French, um, a, a self-published book has been long-listed for a prestigious French prize. And I thought it was interesting, because the, the author is Jewish, uh, or French-Israeli, um, I think it was Jewish, though, a Jewish kind of book. And he felt, I guess, that he wasn't getting a fair crack at things and self-published. And the French um, publishers are just going nuts about this, that a self-published book. Um, and they're blaming Amazon. But, I, you know, I saw that you linked to something saying, you know, just don't blame Amazon when an author, it's an author putting their work out in the world. So what, what's your take on this? Oh, I'm furious. <laughs> I'm really annoyed. It's the booksellers in France actually who okay. really let me down as far as I'm concerned. Yes, you had you had a, the predictable publisher reaction, um, which is varied actually, but booksellers are refusing to stock the book. And, you know, this to me just shows the contempt that the entire business holds for authors, you know. Do they not understand that authors actually are the source of their own income? And the fact that they could do this to an individual author, I think. Now, he seems very sort of laid back and he's amused, but I'm curious. I think it's dreadful. (laughs) I think it's terrible that they would do that to an author. I think it shows just how far removed and the bookseller has, the, the booksellers have become from from authors because of course there's all those intermediaries in between a bookseller. There's the distributor and the wholesaler and the publisher and the agent all the way back to the author. And it just doesn't make sense to me that the source of your income is somebody you would insult in this way. Um, so I think that has to change. Now on a technical note and on a sort of a, a best practice note, he should, of course, be following Alliance of Independent Author Advice and be putting his book up on Ingram Spark. Um, exactly. So that mm. he, his book can be ordered by booksellers. And so there is always a practical way to handle this. But I think the occasion of somebody writing it, the book is on, I've, I've purchased it for reading after I've done my storyteller reading. Um, so I can't wait to read it, actually. But the book has done something incredible. It's something that everybody should be celebrating he it's an incredible achievement on on his part and um it just slipped by as as so many books do you know we're always talking about self-published books when we know that they are self-published but actually if a, if a self-published book is published well enough nobody really knows unless they actually go to the bother of looking and seeing who printed this book where it was printed nobody knows that it's self-published and that's what happened here um if they'd known i'm sure they would have probably chucked it aside so um it's good in the sense that it's raising the issue yeah i agree and i mean in non-fiction this has been this has been happening for ages it's it's a bit different i think there's literary and especially literary in france (laughs) which is you know 
way up there. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting because, of course, nonfiction authors have been doing this for a long time, hardback, sleeves, very professional, using the same printers as traditional publishers. So I think, yeah, I mean, I hope we stop talking about self-publishing at some point and just get on with it. <laughs> I don't think that'll ever come. I think there'll always be a distinction between somebody who puts out their own work and somebody who has an investor, essentially, which is what a, a trade publisher is. I think we'll, you know, we'll always draw that distinction because you were talking about editing earlier. I think that's a really good example. There's no way you would get through any sort of traditional publishing operation without an editor, and editors are essential. And the editor-author relationship is very different when somebody else is paying and when you're paying. So you're mature enough as a person and as a, as a writer to relish that developmental editing challenge and to be delighted that you have somebody who does challenge you but so many indies are either too lazy, too mean, too mean, or too clueless to actually realize how important editing is for reading experience. And as I read um, some of the storyteller entries, it really jumps out at you. You know, it's, most of them now, um, I think the standard of proof reading and line editing has gone up enormously in, in the self-publishing community, but they are still lacking the developmental edits. So I've just finished a book that has three chapters chucked in at the end that absolutely shouldn't be there. It's a non-fiction mm -hmm. book. And they're on a different topic, <laughs> and it's just put in. It's just the, the writer really wants to write about this, and it, it's great. It's really nice, interesting writing, but it belongs in another book. And... I don't blame the author because, you know, at the end of a book, we're all a bit gaga, but I do blame the editor and he, thank, he thanks his editor profusely in the book, but actually his editor has let him down badly. So that's just an example. I think there will always be a distinction between, you know, I put out my own, and I think it's the same in music, someone who puts out their own stuff and someone who's managed, but um, yeah. Mm. Mm. Ongoing things, but um, I think this kind of idea about the long-term development goes into our topic for today around launching, because again, the kind of write and speedily publish is fine if that's your business model, but if you are looking to improve your writing, then you need that kind of depth past which I feel like I'm on my third depth pass and I haven't even been through a proofreader and some beta readers yet so I'll, there will be another one um, but with launching I feel it's similar because sure you can bang a book into KDP select stick a few ads on and then write another book uh, but you and I <laughs> build you know I guess more long-term launch aspects uh, so we're going to talk about that now uh, so, are there any kind of overarching things that you think people need to consider with a launch? Well, for me, I think, you know, we're going to be talking today, you're talking about launching a uh, book 10, did you say, in, in a well-established series, and I'm going to be talking about a newbie sort of stuff, so a new book, first book in a new series and um, launching a poetry book, which I've never even bothered to do before. So we'll be looking at it from, from these different sorts of angles. And I think that's the first thing is to realize that you don't have a, a launch strategy that fits all. And I, I see a lot of people saying, this is what I do when I launch. And certainly that's how I used to do it. You know, I have my checklist of what I did for a launch and it might change, but it basically I apply the same thing to, to most. Well. The checklist didn't always get done, um, but that's a, that's a different story. So what I'm, I suppose the reason we're kind of talking about doing it your way, it's also about doing it your book's way and whatever the, the demand of the book is. So first of all, it's about defining what your success will be for this launch. What are you aiming to actually achieve? Um, and then it's about this particular book and this book's readers. And that became very clear to me. So what I'm doing at the moment, I'm doing a bit of an experiment, really, um, as well as hopefully um, adding to the sales of the books. I'm also curiously watching what I'm kind of doing um, as an experiment. So I'm launching the first book in the Go Creative, which is a non-fiction series for creativepreneurs. And I'm launching a 
poetry book collection. Now, I've never even bothered to launch my poetry before. I just did what you said, but I didn't even put ads behind it. Usually sold to the same people, a lot of whom are in direct contact with me. And I do a lot of direct sales on poetry. So I've never really, um, if you call that marketing, that's as much as, as I have ever done. But I didn't have a proper list, you know, that I kept in touch with or anything like that. So the first thing for me was about that, it was about setting down the, what you call the foundation. And I think that's the, I'm going to let you talk in a second, but I think that's the most important thing is to realize that marketing and promotion are not quite the same thing. And that marketing is about letting people know your book exists, what kind of book it is, what kind of writer you are. Um, and having a relation, building those relationships with readers through your email list and other ways over time. Promotion is about specific to that particular title and what you plan to do. It might be around pricing or it might be around something else, but it's particular to that book at that time. It's a short term thing, whereas the marketing, the foundational marketing goes on and on and on is constantly being refined and improved. Yeah, I think as an overarching thing before we get into specifics, I also think that uh, you, you have to consider as an indie why launches are different to traditional publishing. So, you know, um, traditional publishing gets physical books into physical stores generally, and they focus on spike launch. So in that month, in the and I think books are in bookstores maybe three to six weeks. Um, you know, they're not there forever because there's so many books coming in that they it all goes through. So when traditional publishers do a, a book launch, it has to be in a short period of time. And that author may or may not get assigned some PR person whose job it will be that month to focus on that author. And then, then it's over. They move on to the next author. So that's why I think so many people coming into self-publishing uh, as either new authors or existing authors who are now going indie, they think it has to be the same way. They think, oh, I have to do everything in week one. I have to hit the Sunday Times list or the New York Times list, and I have to get everything in week one. And then they kill themselves. I mean, all the traditional published authors I know, like, just break down at launch. So that's another thing we're talking about here, doing it your way and the kind of longer term sustainable promotion is, sure, it's nice to have a spike, of la at launch and some kind of go up the charts type of thing. But the more important thing is a launch that's sustainable. And even just on the technical side now, it looks like um, Amazon prefers a slow build and consistent sales as opposed to up and then down. So, uh, which is why the ad stacking approach, for example, is, is talked about a lot. So that's another thing, being being really clear about what you want to achieve. Um, and to, uh, for example, relaunching, it can be easier to hit a bestseller list by relaunching much later, <coughs> rather than with a first book or, or a new book when you haven't got reviews on it. So I think that's a really important overarching um, thing. So uh, do we want to get into specifics? Do you want to talk about the specific uh, tasks that you're doing? Yeah, I, um, one more thing before I talk about tasks, and that was um, something that I have learned already from the, this experiment, is that looking at the two different reader types, um, that I kind of had there so the you know and both are kind of very specific and both are minority and um, niche you know they're, they're niche and, and while there is surprising overlap and um, they are very different and it led me to go much more deeply into the psychological sort of needs of hmm. the readers and the understanding that and this will only be applicable to those of us who write across genre but I think a lot of us do and the longer we're in this the, the more that seems to happen because you wouldn't get that opportunity often if your trade published they want you to do the same thing over and again but again because we we can we do um the importance of kind of lining up the list uh, you know and um, segmenting your list but not just segmenting it actually realizing that you speak to uh, uh, certainly this was a realization of mine you speak to the readers of the different kinds of books in a very different way and aligning your email um, you know, uh, communications with the tone and spirit of the book and what the reader enjoys in the book, that you give them, you know, you give them a piece of that 
in your in your list and again this is something that develops over time it's not something you snap 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 and do 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 like you do some of the, the other things we'll be talking about which are kind of tick box things it, this is something that is worth putting a good deal of thought and time and effort into i think but we shall see if it, if it's but it certainly is feeling good and it's feeling i feel for the first time i've got on top of the very different needs of these different readerships yeah, and we've talked about using different names before, but partly it's harder because you're doing nonfiction and poetry and historical fiction under the same name. But as some, you know, I've got Joanna Penn, which is separate, but my, even under JF Penn, people like certain um, series. So the arc, everyone's like, oh, yeah, another arcane book. And then I get an email going, why don't you write another one? Where's the next map? book? You know, and so people like their different series. So even within one name, within... You know, I write several subgenres, but it's still it's closer than what you're doing with with your books. So I do think that name and the list building from the beginning, and this is a good tip actually, because so many people are like, "Oh, I'm just starting out. What should I do?" Like, start building that email list early, but also try and understand your readers, as as Orna says, and really think like, how different are these people? Do I need two different signups? For, for things and I am eventually going to start tagging my series but I haven't quite got around to that yeah you, you can get so granular with this stuff and we only have so much time and it, it depends but I think it is it's also worth looking at your own psychological blocks because it was really interesting to me that I didn't even bother applying what I would consider the absolute basics for any other book to my poetry books and you know i'm really interested to see in, in over a few months will that make a difference i can't see why it how it couldn't or wouldn't you know it um, but it never even that was just a complete blind spot that i had mm -hmm. and what you were talking about there the assumption that launches must be done the way uh, they've always been done challenge all your assumptions around don't wait how i my first self-published book in 2011 was a poetry book so seven years before i realized i wasn't marketing my poetry you know um, so challenge your assumptions look for your blind spots ask other people what they think about your marketing engage with it you know in a, in a real way i think that's the first thing and if you've been marketing for a long time and it's not working don't keep doing that actually mm -hmm. you know go back try something new rip it all out start again um it's very energizing as well and it feeds back into the work as well i think yeah and i think something else that we can learn from traditional publishing is giving things a bit more time so again if you finish if i finish the book and you know i have my proofreader booked and i could publish this in like a week's time probably but i'm not i'm publishing it towards the end of october so that from when we're talking now it's like a month away um so that i have time to do stuff so i want to talk about pre-orders straight up because um you'll remember orna some people might not about three or four years ago we couldn't even do pre-orders and i remember thinking when we have pre-orders everything's going to be amazing and then it stuns me to hear people saying oh don't do pre-orders because you can't get the algorithm spike and i'm like okay guys you know missing the point here the part of the reason we do pre-orders so i just got yesterday or the day before the new robert galbraith which is jk rowling's name i pre-ordered that i don't know 18 months ago <laughs> Because I know I want to read that book, and so I pre-ordered it. It arrives on my Kindle. Woohoo! So for me, the benefit of pre-orders on every platform is that you can start talking about your book early, and people can order it rather than remembering a month later or three months later or whatever uh, that it exists. So um, you know why people don't do this more often? I don't know. Absolutely, I think it's a really. I think you hit on it there with the algorithm thing. The obsession. The absolute obsession with that algorithm <laughs> is a blind spot, people. Yeah. Uh, you know, losing, literally losing the plot um, and, and not realizing that the aim here is to be read, not to please the, the algorithm, you know, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. so um, just 
in, in terms of my recommendations. So I don't set up the pre-order until the book goes to my editor. So that means I know there's a draft. I know that I've booked my editor in advance. So I know the timeline to publication. I know I can read. Because if you don't hit that timeline, you, end, you can end up either canceling it and getting banned from Amazon for a year for your pre-orders. Um, but also putting, you know, putting out a, a product that might be underbaked. So I would suggest don't put up a pre-order until you know the timeline. Then um, you can on Apple and Kobo put up, and I think on Nook you can put up a pre-order up to a year in advance without even a cover. Now some people do that, like I do pre-order books in series I like when they don't have a cover and they don't have a blurb, <laughs> but I'm not quite ready for that myself yet as an, as an indie. So I put it up when I've got a cover and a blurb and now I know I'm like a month out. So then what I'm doing is, um, then you can check all the metadata, this is what I love, so you can look at your um, keywords, your categories, you can, uh, you know, finesse things, see what it looks like on the store, get your, what your page set up on your website, you can start talking to people about it, doing some content marketing, you know, I've mentioned Valley of Dry Bones quite a lot on this show, and on my own show, and so to me, having the pre-order takes things off your plate. Remember, we talked at the beginning about sustainability in your practice, and that is your marketing practice, not just your creative practice. So to me, the pre-order means I have less on my plate for that week. So I can start scheduling all these other things, which we'll come back to in a minute. But to me, that pre-order is so critical. So at the moment, uh, Valley of Dry Bones is on pre-order for ebook on the five platforms, the main platforms and all the little ones, whatever. Off you go, people, pre-order. Yeah, I think, are you doing pre-order, Orna? I'm not, but you're, you're really making, I will next time. <laughs> you better. <laughs> well, I did, I did pre-orders before and I didn't handle them very well. And um, so, yeah, I mean, okay, next time. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what I've done for the first time this time that I've never done that I'm quite proud of. Okay, so this time I put the pre-order up, so the ebooks are live as pre-orders on, let's say, the five main stores. And then what I did is I went into book nine, which is end of days, and I have republished the ebook with the link to the pre-order in the back of the book. Now, I've never done that before. I've never been that organized. Um, but now at the end, like if you buy end of days, on Kindle, for example, or Kobo, you're going to see at the end a link to the pre-order for the next book. And it doesn't just say pre-order, it's, you know, buy the book here. So I don't have to update it again after go live. Like, don't do anything where you have to keep updating stuff. Um, so that link is there. But then what I've done, which again, I'm quite pleased to have organized, is I applied for a book bob on book nine. I've got um, Bargain Booksy, I've got an ENT book of the day, I'm doing ads, so I've got my ads ready. So I'm doing a whole month of promotion on end of days, or like 21 days, three weeks of promotion on book nine, that will hopefully lead to me more pre-orders for book 10. Now, um, some people say, oh, shouldn't you just uh, advertise book one? in the series, but the, the fact is, I mean, how many people are going to read through 10? We all know you get drop off. And also, you can join this series at any point because they're all standalone as well. So I actually, I'm pretty pleased with myself to have organized things like that. That's absolutely fantastic. It's super inspiring to me, and I will definitely emulate that. It just, just seems like a fantastic strategy. And um, I think it's important to say that what you said there about being organized now, being organized enough and having gone through the process enough. So uh, people who are listening and beginning to feel overwhelmed by Joanna's incredible energy and organizational skills, <laughs> even she built up to here. But the point being, you know, take it step by step, but take anything that feels useful and then just jump on it and do it. If it sounds to you like it's, it's a good idea and it's something you can do, then do it, try it, and test and see, did it work? How did it work? What would you do different and better next time out? Yeah, well, this is, as I said, I've been doing pre-orders for a number of years, so this is the first time I've actually organized uploading these other files. Um, I think another thing that's happening, obviously, people moving from CreateSpace over to KDP Print, and what that meant for me is that I revisited my metadata on some of those older books. So I've been revisiting keywords, um, and that's actually been a good thing, having to look at books that are now five years old even two years old, it's just like, oops, maybe I should have changed that. So you, you'd like, that's been a, a good part of that process. There are um, new categories 
now that there weren't when I printed last time. Um, and I'd like to just point, run back to something you said there a few minutes ago, um, the strategies that you were talking about with all the ads. That is what is known, if you hear the term, people as ad stacking. So, um, and that's something you do every time? Yeah, pretty much. Since I listened to my friend Mark Dawson, I, I do, but I don't do ads all the time. This is the difference. I, I, you know, I mean, we are similar in this way, find it soul destroying to do ads. I'd much rather be creating, but I understand the benefit of doing them at launch. So I will do a really focused batch, couple of weeks, Facebook ads, Amazon ads, BookBub ads, any ads, whatever, and then I will stop. <laughs> and then I will get back and do the next book. But what I was going to say also, so um, some of the other things that I've been building up over time is the um, street team or the arc list or the, um, I've got pen friends for JF Pen. So I, over time, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, pen friends with a double M. Team. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, I do not not really streak enough. Um, but yes, yeah, so what I do, what I'll do with um, my art team is I will when I send out the thing for the pre-order to my whole list, I invite some people to then join the pen friends. Say if you're really keen and you think you can read the book on launch, uh, you can apply to join my pen friends. And then I also have a few hundred existing pen friends who I will then email with the um, ebook. And many of them will actually order the book um, as well because they're lovely and they're fans and they just like to get it early. Um, so that's really cool. So again, building up your email list and then a subset of it takes time. And I, I just, I mean, hats off to anyone who can do that with a first book. But, you know, I, I think if you can take one thing at a time, then you can start improving it. So basically what I do is they get the book early. I ask them... Uh, to leave a review, an honest review. They don't get the book in exchange for a, re a review. <laughs> they just get the book, and if they want to leave one, great. And then, um, yeah, so that's kind of using an email list and pre-order. And one thing I was going to say on this as well about definition of success, I will, I will. my pre-order is full price. So I'm going with more of a traditional publishing view, which is your front list should be full price because... It's a new book, yeah. and that, I'm looking. Yeah. yeah, and I'm looking to maximise revenue because I'm a full-time author. But end of days is being reduced, so that's a backlist book. So that's going down to ninety-nine cents, and the pre-order will be the four ninety-nine US dollars uh, full price. So some people advocate doing a lower price launch again, so that you may sell more and go up the algorithms. But I'm far more concerned about revenue and also just you know keeping a value on my new work I guess what do you think about pricing on launch I agree I think that I, well, first of all not just on launch but all round indies are underselling themselves and we've just seen some very interesting research on that so we think that our readers are more price sensitive than they are um, and that's a sort of a feeling that we've had at Ally for a very long time and that has been confirmed by the research. And the other thing, is, particularly if you're going wide and on other platforms, so Amazon readers tend to be more price sensitive, but again, they are very willing to, to, um, to go more. So we've got the traditional publishing thing, which is kind of holding the price for ebooks at the print price and not burying it. And then at the other end of the extreme, we have indies giving them their work away at a point that doesn't, isn't profitable. And I think the way around this is build profit into every transaction. So don't actually have any transaction going out from you with a, you know, that is hopeful or that is, unless it, unless it is clear and clever strategic use of free or low, uh, you know, ridiculously low pricing. Um, in which case you're very, very clear and you have a goal at the end of it and you know what that goal is and you will know whether you reached it or not by use of a figure, not by use of some vague feeling at the back of your brain. Um, don't do that. You're better to hold your pricing and until you really understand what you are doing and generally speaking, put your prices up a little bit from where they are and see what happens. We've had many instances of members who put their prices up and so more, not less. So yeah. Make sure you experiment with pricing and then experiment, yeah, with how you price at launch. But to me, it makes 
total sense uh, the strategy you're using. People love the new, and particularly on a on a you know book ten in a series, people really want that book if they've stayed with you all the way through to now, and that you would ch price cheaply at the moment, where most people are most avid about wanting to get their hands on it, makes absolutely no sense. But I think the general principle to build in is profit everywhere. Put your profit in there first. Take your profit out first as well. Uh, don't dump it back into your expenses. And just become profit-minded is something that a lot of Indies need to do. Mm. Uh, and then I'm also obviously looking at my other formats. So I will have um, I will I, the pre-order is on the ebook now. You can do print pre-orders with Ingram Spark, and I have managed to time that before. But this time, I think depending on how things go, I might just be like a week before, or I might just be on time. But certainly, my print book will go live with the ebook, and that will definitely be a normal paperback. But I may also do a large print because I'm finding large print to be a good. Uh, investment because it's not very much extra money to create and then it's just another product um, and I seem to have started a large print revolution so carry on people I, I wish Bellum would bring in a large a large print option well there were, everybody who needs large print tell Vellum and they will eventually get to it I mean they have a massive development list and if they move things up depending on how many people want them so um, yeah, we'll get there, I think. And then my audio, so I have but I have a narrator for the series, so I've booked her. But because you know she's a you know she's slightly booked out, so my audio book I would like to have live, but will probably be a month after the initial launch. That's quite normal, um, I think. Yeah, I think it's very normal for for different formats to stagger in well later than that. But it is your aim, I believe, to try and have all the formats there together from the start. You've done that, yes, time, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. And a big a big shift. Well, kind of. I don't know. I'm still I'm still kind of on the fence. No, I'm not. I think I'm doing it. I have booked a voice coach for October, so that I can start narrating fiction. Ooh, I know, yeah. big deal. It's a really That's big amazing. deal. Oh no, I never want to do that. Um, I, I, I did a small bit of kind of looking at me narrating my own stuff and beyond poetry, I couldn't, can't think about it. <laughs> well, this is, okay, so coming on to content marketing. So okay. this is mainly because I really feel that with more and more and more content out there in the world, like books and with China literature, we're seeing coming in with potentially millions, with AI, with everything going on what I found with audio and, and the rise and rise of audio is incredible if people like to listen to your voice they are going to be loyal to your voice the author voice but also the narrator voice so um, you can be a straight narrator a straight read narrator you don't need to do accents um, and I just feel I'm gonna start with short stories but I feel like this could be a way to combine content marketing with an income stream in the same way that podcasting has become for me with non-fiction. So I'm seeing a voice coach because as we we both did this a couple of years ago and found it exhausting, I feel like I just need some training. Um, so I really look forward to hearing more about that. That's, that's so, so interesting. And audio has been super successful for you on the non-fiction front and you love exactly. it. Yeah. You absolutely love it, yeah. yeah. So I want to do that with fiction. Also, I want to. I do want to focus, obviously, I, I'm now focusing more on my fiction. If I can do short stories or my shorter books, novellas, it's going to really help me speed up my audio creation. Um, but then just staying on content marketing for the launch process, I have also, at this point, already ordered... Um, my Facebook ads from my book cover designer, um, the wonderful JD Smith from Ally, uh, and also uh, the wonderful Sasha Black, who's also an Ally member, who's doing my pictures for Instagram, because I'm trying, really trying with Instagram. This launch, I've never really used Instagram until this year. So for JF Pen, so I'm at JF Pen author. So really trying with that, because Twitter I use for nonfiction, but Instagram just seems to be it's just more fun. It's more fun. It, it definitely is. So is Sasha helping you with the actual strategy for, for Instagram? Well, she's, we are, she, we, we, she's helping me with my pictures and we've had some chats and she's fantastic. So, she's yeah. yeah. So I, and I just saw what she was doing and was like, you're amazing. <laughs> and she takes some beautiful pictures. So 
right? yeah, yeah that's the thing so really great to be able to talk to other indies who are more successful than you in different areas and potentially barter what you have in return um, for skills so that I think is a really good thing I'm also um, but because this book is based on my travels so Mallorca and Spain um, where else uh, Toledo Madrid San Francisco, New Orleans. What I'm going to do, originally I was uploading my pictures directly onto things like Pinterest, but now because I want to get more traffic, I'm going to do blog posts on jfpen.com and then link to Pinterest through the website so that I keep the copyright on the photos and also get the tracking back because Pinterest marketing for books seems to be also really good. So that's something I haven't done either for launches before. So I'm really doubling down on content marketing for fiction, whereas before I've really focused that on nonfiction, similar to you saying you just haven't tried stuff for poetry. So does that yeah. give you some ideas too? Yeah, and I have also come very much to this idea of using different social media for in different ways for different things. So it's really interesting to hear you talk about content marketing for fiction in that way, because a lot of people would say you can't do content marketing for fiction, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Mm. So it's about finding your way in. So for me, with the poetry, for example, uh, again, because trying to make it profitable which poets just don't think that way and and you know writing about that as well but understanding that um social media you know which social medium would you use and while i like twitter for all sorts of things it wasn't the right one so i too have centered on instagram for poetry and i'm taking them to the patreon page rather than to my website or doing the normal sign up thing Finding that through Facebook advertising, actually, finding that the people who buy the poetry are a different age group and segment and, um, you know, things like that. But understanding that you don't have to use every social medium in exactly the same way as well, that different ones suit different um, projects. So... I think that's something I certainly am, you know, reconfiguring and, and thinking about all these things and even thinking about Wattpad as um, mm. definitely begin to think again about ways in which, creative ways in which you can use Goodreads, you know, all these people where we know readers are and that we, you know, when we hit that first difficulty, you kind of go, hmm, I don't know what to do, and you fade off. And over time, again, it's all about time and having time to do these things, but also about letting them percolate. You find a way, maybe, that it can be useful. So, yeah, I'm documenting all of this on the website, which, again, is something I've never done before. I've never actually discussed what I'm doing marketing-wise before. And mm -hmm. it's a great, no, not publicly, uh, but create, you know, bits of paper falling off the desk. That's been my marketing plan in the past. And what's great about making it public is you have to make sense to some degree. Anyway, your mm. sentences have to be finished and you have to have a bit more clarity. And also you can go back and refer to it and, and so on. So I'm enjoying that process too. So, yeah, it's um, there'll be more to talk about on this, I guess, as, as the launches go through and we see how, how they deliver. Yes, um, so talking about that, actually, by the time we talk next, because we are both speaking all over the world, you're going to be in Italy, and I'm going to be in America, and then you're in America, and then I'm going back to America, and we're all just running around talking. Um, so our next thing will be Monday, 29th of October, when um, Valley of Dry Bones will be launched, um, will, and you will have launched yours, both of yours as well? Yep, they'll both be out in the world at that stage. Oh, and good. Yeah, we'll, have, we'll be able to talk about how they went. Um, just to say that the while the live uh, um, Facebook, you know, what we're doing now will be on the Facebook page on that date. The podcast actually releases on the first uh, Saturday of the month, always. So we're recording early today. So mm. We'll run on the podcast at the normal time if people are looking for the audio. People are wondering, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can get us in so many ways. We're all over the all over the place. But we'll also be reporting back. I'm actually speaking on content marketing at Nink. Uh, so this is something I'm really I'm really doubling down on right now, trying to figure it out because um, it's it's what I've built my business on for nonfiction. So I can totally do this for for fiction. Um, and you'll be. We'll also hear from Digital Book World. I guess you'll. Sh that should be interesting. 
Yes, it's looking really exciting and very interesting and um, talking about the, there's a workshop, doing a workshop for those of you who are attending. I know we've lots of allies going along, which is going to be great. And we have a big booth right in the front, um, very visible place for Indies, which is fantastic. And we have um, a workshop on running an Indie office business. There's, um, I'll be doing a presentation, a plenary session on self-publishing 3.0. And we're doing, Alexa and I are doing a fireside chat about vanity publishing and why it's not a good thing and what, mm. hybrid, what hybrids are and how hybrid is now being used by a lot of the vanity people to slither in all sorts of horrible business models. Um, yeah, and just generally getting together there in Nashville, Tennessee. And we're going to the Ingram Spark plant for um, a behind your books kind of sneak peek at, at what goes on there as the books are being made and doing a morning session of education there with the Ingram people as well. So that's going to be a really good outing. And what I love about DBW and the way the new owners have positioned it and created it is that everybody is there in the same room being treated exactly the same. So every we've got, you know, Amazon's in the room, the traditional publishers are in the room, we're in the room, lots of micro publishers, people who are interested in voice technology, lots of mm -hmm. lots of tech people and all kind of learning from each other. So there should be lots to report from there. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And I'm actually up for two awards. So if I win anything, you have to go and get it for oh, me. I didn't do anything about the awards. Oh, yes, I will be thrilled. <laughs> like you, 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 you have to. Oh, so you I'm not win. I'm sure you will. Well, I'm up for um, best podcast for book marketing or something. And also um, publishing commentator, which I thought was <laughs> fascinating. That's good. Yeah. So if I win, you're, you're my proxy. You, okay. you go get me a prize or whatever. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> that would be cool. Okay, everyone. So, um, yeah, I guess that's it for this month. And happy writing, happy publishing, happy launching. And as ever, let us know any questions or comments uh, on whatever you're listening or watching this on. That would be the best thing. Absolutely. That's great. And thanks for joining us. And, yeah, have a good, a good writing and a good publishing month. Take care. Bye. Bye.